Well, as you can probably tell, uh, we are gearing up for Christmas around here. In fact, if you've driven pretty much anywhere over the last 48 hours, um, you've seen sort of this transformation. The lights are up and the, the uh, slightly biblically incorrect nativity is out on the front lawn because the wise men are there, but they didn't really show up for two years. So. And, and people are getting ready. Um, and we're excited about that. If I'm honest, I am, I, I love the whole thing. Like, I love this time of year. I love this season. I love the, the gatherings. I love the lights. I love the food. I love being with family and the presents. And I just, I, I love all of it. And yet I also recognize and, and can be aware of the fact that at times our cultural celebration of, of Christmas can, it, it doesn't always necessarily remind us of, of what this is really always about. It, it doesn't always direct us to the true significance of what we celebrate and what we remember. But, but one thing that I feel like, it, it, where we get it right, I guess you would say, is, is the sense of anticipation. Um, maybe that's not, not true for everyone, but you, you particularly see it in the eyes and hearts of kids, right? Like there's just this sense that something is coming. It's, it's getting closer with, with each day and there's, there's waiting, but there's, there's waiting with a hope. When we, when we capture that, when we recognize that in our, in our own experience, in our own heart and our lives, when we see those qualities, then we, we get just a glimpse, a reminder of what generation after generation after generation of, of Jewish families longed for and waited for as they hoped and prayed for the promise of a deliverer, of a rescuer, of a Messiah. And... And, and as we re-enter this story, as we re-engage with, with something that for many of us can be almost so familiar that it's, it's, um, it's hard to take fresh eyes and, and look at it again with a new, but we realize that, that this promise has been, has been kept, that, that the deliverer, a rescuer has been provided for us. As a church, we, the celebration of of Advent is tended for you and I to create space in our hearts and lives to, to spiritually re-enter into the story in that sense of, of a waiting, but a waiting that's defined by hope. But as we do that, as we, as we re-enter into that, we also come with the awareness that, that this has been a, a promise that has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus, that's the reason that we, we worship together. That's the reason why we sing together. And so I want to pause just for a moment to pray that God would use this time together to allow us in a fresh way to, re, to re-enter his story. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you um, for what we've already expressed today in our worship of who you are and what you've done and your willingness to take on flesh in order to redeem and restore us into relationship with you. Don't let us lose sight um, of what you have accomplished on our behalf, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this year, of these next four weeks together, right, we're going to look at the Gospel of John and the way that, that John somewhat uniquely chooses to describe the events of, of God entering into the human experience as, as one of us. And specifically, his description of Jesus as, as the light of the world. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to John chapter 1. I'm going to read kind of the, the whole section that we're going to focus on over these four weeks. And then this morning, we're going to kind of spend our time unpacking verses 1 through 5. So this is from John chapter 1. John writes, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing that was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. So that through him, all might believe. 
He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, oftentimes during Advent, we will read one of the gospel accounts of, of Jesus and of Mary and Joseph and shepherds and and stars that are announcing the arrival of the messiah and you will notice right away that that the apostle john takes a very different approach that that none of that is here and that rather than talking through sort of the historical count of uh context of of what took place and and who was there john talks almost exclusively about the, uh, the theological implications, uh, about the, the spiritual impact of God being willing to take on flesh and entering into our stories, entering into the mess of, of sin and brokenness and the human condition in order to bring light into to darkness. So today, as I mentioned, I wanna just kind of spend some time unpacking, if we, if we can together, some of what John emphasizes in these first five verses as as he looks at and depicts Jesus as the light of life. And the first thing that that John emphasizes here in this text is the power of the word, the power of the word. From the time I was a a small kid up till now, I have always had a hobby and interest in woodworking. I have always loved tools. I flip through catalogs like all the time. It's just, and, and I was that way from day one. In fact, my parents would tell you from the very first time that I could articulate what I wanted for Christmas, I asked for tools. And so like any good parents, when a three-year-old asked for tools, they went out and bought like a Fisher Price like tool bench and there's like a little hand saw and a plastic screwdriver and all these things. And they said almost instantly, I was like, this is garbage. Like, I can't work with this stuff. Like, <laughs> right? like because it was, it was, it had no power, right? Like, it had no ability to accomplish what my little three-year-old mind, I, I wanted to try to do with this stuff. And so by the time I was five, they said they were buying me real tools. By the, ten, the time I was 10, I had my first ever, like, power table saw which feels like actually poor parenting. Those things are really dangerous. See, the when John is is writing his gospel here, one one of the primary questions that he wants to address at the very outset, much much like Paul did when we were looking at, at his letter to the Colossians together, is the question of who is Jesus. It is is the story of Jesus, the story of one who has come to, to represent God? Is, is, is he entering into the picture, acting on behalf of God as if God has got a sort of more important places to be? Is he just this, as many thought, is he just this really good teacher who had great insights? Is he just this effective and powerful, dynamic rabbi? In short, is Jesus just some sort of reduced or limited version of the real thing? And if so, then ultimately incapable of doing what, what really needs to be done. And so John, he, he, was, he starts his gospel. He wants to leave no room for confusion on this point. Again, this is what he writes. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Do you hear that? So, so, so John, when he, and he's writing to a, uh, largely to a Jewish 
audience here and he does something important. He starts to explain to them who Jesus is by intentionally echoing the book of Genesis. And not only the book of Genesis, but specifically the way in which Genesis describes God's activity and and the creation of the world. This is from Genesis chapter one. Let's flip over there real quick. Listen to the Listen to the echo here. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the water and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so John, as he introduces his, his, um, his gospel, as he begins to describe for the people, the recipients of his letter, who Jesus is. He intentionally writes in such a way to to connect them to a previous event, to connect them to that which they were already familiar with. An event that in, in their mind displayed the creative power and ability of God when, when out of nothing, through the power of his word, he spoke the cosmos into being. See, so, so John, when, when he's talking about who Jesus is, when he's answering this question about, about who he is, he places him in the story of creation, but not only does he put him there, he puts him there as the one who is doing the creating. Like we we uh, will sometimes explain to people um, something about who a person is based on what they've done before, Right? Like I was uh, in the car with my kids and that uh, Paul McCartney song came on. Um, Simply have, you know, that one, you know, a wonderful Christmas time. You know, and, and I was complaining about that song as, as we all should. Um, <laughs> and, and so one of them asked who, who sang that and I was explaining uh, who Paul, or I said that it was Paul McCartney and then they said, well, who's Paul McCartney? And then I was explaining, well, he was, he was one of the Beatles, and he wrote a lot of what they did. And although he did really well here, this isn't so good. But right, you, this is, the, in a positive sense, this is, John is, is placing their awareness and understanding in the fullness of who Jesus is by, by evoking something that they were very familiar with. And they knew where God's creative power was displayed, and he puts Jesus there. And the second thing that he does here when he's talking about the, the fullness of, the, of, of who Jesus is, is he, he uses this unique way to talk about him where he talks about him as the word. The word is the, the Greek word logos. We've talked about this before, but in, in doing this, John, John not only conjures up or, or is relevant to a Jewish audience, but he really now speaks also to to a Greek audience, to somebody that's looking at this question through that worldview and through that perspective. I, I've put up on the screen the definition of, of that word because in Greek philosophy, the term logos came to mean or reflect um, a, a way that they would describe ultimate reality, a way that they would talk about what is, what is the navigating principle that gives life and gives meaning to the universe. But what was interesting is that in Greek philosophy, the logos was thought of as an impersonal force, one that was not capable of of being known, not capable of loving or or being loved. So, So John brilliantly speaks the language of his day. But, but he, what he does here is more than a correlation between a relevant way of, of thinking in that culture it's, it's more than a connection to that. He, he transforms the idea of it. The logos that John describes is a person. It's one who later he will show us is the very definition of love. It, it's one who not only he will describe as, as somebody who can be known, but somebody who can be received and conversely could be rejected. See, John, John speaks both to his Jewish audience and, and to men and women living in this, this Greek mindset, this way of thinking, and he describes the power of the word as the person of Jesus. He, he describes him as the one who is outside of time, as the one who is the uncreated creator, the divine essence as the one who was there in the beginning, who was before all things. 
He defines him as the logos or the organizing entity behind everything. And he's saying this, this God has taken on human flesh. He's taken our nature and become one of us. So the, the vulnerability of a child being born into poverty is not, it's, this is not merely a representation of this God, of this word. This is not a, a, a limited or a reduced version of the real thing. John's whole point here is that God himself has entered into the human story and he's done so to bring life and to bring light. John wants to make sure as we, as we read his gospel together, that we understand the fullness of who Jesus is, that there's no confusion on that point. And the second thing that, that John then speaks to as he describes all of this is, is what I'm calling the gift of life. The gift of life. This is in, in verse four again. This is what John writes. He says, in him was life. And that life was the light of, of all mankind. In, in essence, he is the source. He's where it originates from. Uh, last week, if you were here, I was talking about growing up in Dayton, Ohio, and how the, the Air Force Museum in Dayton was sort of our claim to fame, one of the things that, that, that we had to be proud of. There was another, especially when I was kind of in my teenage years, there was another thing that uh, Ohio was known for at the time, and that was Longenberger Baskets. And did anybody ever have a Longenberger basket? Yep. I mean, this was like a whole thing. Like there was like, it was, you could go to those like parties and it'd be, and they were expensive. Like people collected them. And in fact, I brought a picture. This is their headquarters in Dresden, Ohio. They, they made their building to look like one of, of their baskets. In the year 2000, when they were at the peak of, of their business, they did over a billion dollars in sales in Longenberger baskets, right? And, and their claim to fame is that every one of these baskets originated in Dresden, Ohio. And there was all sorts of like knockoff versions. There was things that people did, but if it was a genuine, true Longenberger basket, it was handcrafted by somebody in, in Dresden, Ohio apparently in a building that looked like one of their baskets, right? <laughs> Which it turns out that was a bad business model because they went bankrupt last year and have closed down. So all your long and burger baskets, maybe now they're worth more or something like that. See, sometimes you and I will we'll make the, we'll say to each other, have you ever like had something good happen in life and say, now that's living? Like now that, that is, that's living. But what do we, what do we mean by that? T typically, we'll be referring to some sort of extraordinary thing that happens, something really good, some unusual comfort that we're experiencing and say, now this is what it means to, to be alive. See, but John here, he is originating life in, in the word, in the logos. He is the source. He's, he's the author. And now John is revealing that the source of life that was there when earth was spoken into its, be, into its being has, has also now come to be the giver of life. And, and in doing this, John is, again, he is, if you were a, a Jewish man or woman growing up reading this letter, you would immediately hear Genesis chapter 2 as he's describing this. And what's what was depicted when, when God spoke life into humanity, when, when he animated humankind. This is from the second half of verse seven in Genesis chapter two. It says, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Right, we, we talk a lot about this at Chapel Street because it, this message, the idea of, of getting life, receiving life, it's at the very heart of, of the gospel, but, but it's important for us to restate. Specifically, as we, as we think about and talk about Advent and, and Christmas and the significance of what God is doing on our behalf, because what John wants us to understand is that the giver of life is moving to us. He has come to us as the source of all life for the purpose of giving us life. Paul would write in Romans, right, that the impact or the implication, the result of sin is in no uncertain terms, death. But then he goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
What, what was lost when humankind chose to define for themselves what was good or bad, what was right or wrong is now being restored with the entrance of the word into the human story, into our experience, into, into our mess. This is how he describes Jesus. He became one of us, the source of life, to give us life in him. See, the challenge so often for you and I is, is that we have this tendency, this propensity to, to believe that life is, is elsewhere or, or to settle. And so in the absence of, of this genuine experience of life in Christ, we settle for some cheap imitation. Some, some knockoff that is merely a, a shadow of the real thing. And the problem is that, that whatever sort of quote unquote life we gain from our, our careers or our accomplishments or our approval ratings or our bank accounts or our kids' abilities in sports or academics or whatever it is, it always leaves us wanting. It, it always leaves us longing for something more because true life is found in and given by the author of life. You have to go to the real source, to where it originated from, to the giver of it, to get the real thing. And John says, I've got great news. I've got great news because he has come to us and he's come to us to give us life. Jesus would, would define his own purpose later in John's gospel in the 10th chapter by simply saying that I have come, that they may have life and, and have it to the full. Jesus' own stated purpose for why he came here to be with us was that we may have life. Thirdly then here in these verses, John describes Jesus in this, the event of his arrival with the hope of light. He describes it with the hope of light. I don't know if you have ever been like, really, really lost in the dark, but it's terrifying. Um, my friend, Kim McCart, uh, when, when she was still with us, she uh, was, worked with me in student ministries and she would help lead some of our, our short-term missions trips. And she told me the story, this was before my, my time at Chapel Street, that in one of our teams down in Ecuador, when we were staying in the jungle, um, that, that we had this sort of these, these bungalow things. They were open air. You would sleep with a, a mosquito net over you. And, and there were two sections of them. One was kind of down at the entryway um, and the other was up on the side of the hill. And we would alternate year to year who was staying where. Sometimes the guys would be down and, and, and the girls would be up on the hill and vice versa. And this particular year, the girls were up on the hill. And to get there, you took a trail up through the jungle. And um, we were, they were having team time and, and things kind of ran a little late. One of the students wanted to talk with her and in the jungle, it, it gets dark every night, 6 p.m. And we're not talking like a dark that you and I are used to. We're, like this is the, like if you get in the canopy of the jungle, there is no light to be seen anywhere. Like literally, I can't see my hand in front of my face level of dark. And so it was evening and, and she realized it. And so they started to make their way up the trail to, um, to go back to their cabins. And about halfway up the trail, the battery on her flashlight just died like that. And it was pitch black. She says to the student, you know, do you have a, a flashlight with you? And they, no. And, th and they were just sort of like frozen there. Like what do we, we can't, we literally cannot see the trail. We don't know what's in front of us. And to make matters like a little bit worse, like off in the distance, and they didn't know what this was at the time, they could just see tiny little glimmers. And apparently in the jungle there, there's a, a small spider that has this, excretes this, um, I don't know, poison probably, like that's, <laughs> that glows in the dark, right? So this would have been the point in the story where you would have just found my body laid out on the trail. Like I would have had a heart attack. But about that time, there, there was one of our interns from El Refugio was started her way up the trail. And she said, like, I, she could tangibly describe for you the feeling of seeing that light break through the darkness, of a sense that they, this, they weren't going to be left there, that there was someone 
coming to rescue them. And then you could see it in the distance and it was getting closer and closer and closer. And this is how John describes the arrival of Jesus. This light breaking into the darkness. He says in verse four, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness, he says, has not overcome it. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the events that John is writing and describing here, says it this way in Isaiah chapter nine. He says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. See, John, throughout his entire gospel, will continue to contrast light and darkness. In fact, he he describes it more as a a battle, a battle in which there is a clear winner. And he keeps coming back to this imagery, John's description of the world, of, of the human condition apart from Christ is that of darkness. He says it's, it's defined by evil and brokenness and sin and judgment, and we kind of like to whitewash that a little bit in our, especially this time of year, like we're all nicer to each other, we're all, but when we, when we look at what's unfolding around us, when we take a glimpse at the news, like we, there's no doubt in our minds about what our condition is. Like we don't typically argue this. And so, so John is speaking into that awareness and that reality, and he says, a light has dawned. We, we, the darkness provides, it provides hiding, because as we sing, a, a sing about in that song, like our, our shame forces us into hiding, and John says, into that shame, a light has dawned, and he defines it, it's the hope of a savior. It is the disruption of the darkness with truth and grace. Later in his gospel, he records Jesus saying, he says, this is the words of Jesus in John chapter 12. He says, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Earlier in chapter eight, Jesus says this. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So when John, when Don describes, when he talks about Jesus as the light, about light breaking in and, and, and breaking up the darkness, what does he want us to hear? What, 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 what is it that he wants us to understand? So I think he, I want, he wants us to hear hope. He, he, he wants uh, to remind us that, that the hope of, of someone who is in need of rescue, seeing their rescuer on their way. He wants us to hear freedom, the freedom that that, that we discover when we stop hiding in in shame and brokenness and that we live in the light, right? In 1 John chapter 1, he, he depicts this in much greater detail. And I think he wants us to hear victory. Because the power of the word, the author and the creator of life himself has come to give life and to shine a light into the darkness. This this is what John wants us to understand as he begins to tell the story and it's what we wanna be reminded of as we think about Advent, as we think about what we celebrate and why we celebrate because this is what it's about because this is what he's done. You know, as a church, we, um, we have seasons like this to, to remember. And I want to um, invite the worship team to come up because God in his grace and wisdom not only gave us um, opportunities to stop and pause and remember, but he also gave us the bread and the cup as a way to do that. And, and one of my favorite times to celebrate communion is during Advent because I think that, that the correlation between what we just talked about and what we remember and, and, and why we do all of this alongside of the tangible reminder of the bread and the cup is such a powerful picture of, of light breaking into the darkness um, of, of a life that he gives. And so I'm going to pray for us in just a moment, and our ushers will pass the the elements. You can take both cups. They're stacked together and hold on to those. Um, I'll come up and guide us in the receiving of the elements. If you're new with us, you're welcome to receive communion 
um, here with us. The only stipulation that we see in scripture around taking communion is that we're in a relationship with Jesus and that we are allowing him to shine his light into our life so that we will continually run to grace. Um, and then I will guide us in the receiving of the cup and the receiving of, of the bread. Would you pray with me? Father, we again, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to, um, to be reminded of a story that oftentimes we can be so familiar with that the impact of it is, is lost on us. So thank you for John's passion and his desire to, to have the church fully understand who you are and what was taking place um, in those events some 2,000 years ago. So remind us again as we come to the table of the light that, that brings life, that breaks into the darkness. Remind us again that you are the one, you are the source of all life and that you came that we may have life in you. And it's in your name we pray, amen.